Well, good morning. So, Glenn, I appreciate uh, some enthusiasm for Greenville University. You probably know this. I don't get a lot of that here in Michigan. Um, I'm actually, I'm serving as an adjunct professor this semester at Spring Arbor University. I'm teaching a, yeah, there we go. I'm teaching um, a church planting class, and I asked the, the chaplain, uh, Dr. Brian Kono, I said, can I wear a Greenville University sweatshirt on my first night of class? And he said, it's in the contract that you cannot do that. So, but he didn't, he didn't say anything about the subsequent week. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. And yes, uh, Pastor Rob and I, we have um, a Chicago area connection. So we both have been sent here as missionaries to Michigan and uh, grateful to be here. I, I've actually been in Michigan now almost seven years, kind of hard to believe. Prior to being in the Portage area, I had the, the joy of serving as the lead pastor of our church in Dearborn. So it's always good to be back in uh, the metro Detroit area. We, we grew to, to love this area, and uh, anytime I return, it's with great affection. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open to Isaiah chapter 61, and we'll get there in just a couple moments. And I also just want to say, so um, Rob shared that I have to advance my own slides. And every speaker's different. Some speakers really kind of rely on their slides. Others, it's I have the slides for the people. I'm more of the latter, so I may forget to advance them. Just going to tell you that up front. You can, um, you, know, you can get the slides afterwards if I miss some, but just wanted to let you know that. So uh, Rob had asked me to, to come and share on one of our free Methodist values. Um, so a couple of years ago, our board of bishops at the time uh, got together and actually kind of hired some people from the outside to help them really uh, kind of pray and think through who are we as free Methodists. Uh, those of you who have maybe been free Methodists for a long time, maybe someone has asked you the question, what is a free Methodist? And usually we will kind of say, well, we're not United Methodists, which isn't always the best answer. And so uh, they, they really wanted to help our denomination have some language. Here's who we are. Here's what makes us unique. Here's the values that shape us. And so they clarified five values, and they refer to this as the free Methodist way. So let's try this. Let's see how I'm doing. All right, we're good. We're off to a good start. So here's the five that they came up with. Christ-compelled multiplication, cross-cultural collaboration, life-giving holiness, God-given revelation, and then the one that your pastors asked me to share on today is love-driven justice. And I want us to begin by looking at this value uh, by reading together a statement that our bishops came up with. So would you go ahead and read this with me? Love is the way we demonstrate God's heart for justice by valuing the image of God in all men, women, and children acting with compassion toward the oppressed, resisting oppression, and stewarding creation. We devote ourselves to our founders' deep convictions around matters of injustice as they took their stand against the evils of slavery, the oppression of the poor, the marginalization of women, and the abuse of power in the church. Our heart for justice continues and expands today fueled by God's holy love for the unborn, the vulnerable, oppressed, marginalized, and people of all races and ethnicities. The free Methodist way is not only to realize a better society, but that all may be reconciled to God and one another in ways that reflect God's just character. I think that is a powerful statement. And it is my hope uh, that everyone in here would be in wholehearted agreement with that statement. I also know that when it comes to justice, that can be a bit of a charged word, can't it? Uh, th th it's a word, it's an idea that can be almost polarizing. It's a hot button issue in our culture and in the church today. And when I think about that, uh, I, I can't help but think that there's some that as soon as they hear justice, maybe their antennas go up and right away they're wondering, okay, what's the preacher going to say here? What, is, what does this person mean by justice? Um, when does the church get so political? Well, why can't we just talk about the gospel? Why, is it, why do we have to talk about social justice? And here's what I want to say this morning right off the bat. I don't think the issue is with justice. I think the issue is with how we often approach justice, 
how we think about justice, what our understanding of justice is. Another way to put it is, the issue isn't justice. It's the lens through which we look at justice, through which we view justice. So about five, six years ago, uh, I started saying to my wife that when I was reading, things were becoming a little blurrier. Anyone ever, ever experienced that? Yeah. Um, and I was telling her, I said, you know, like when I'm, when I'm working on a document on Microsoft Word, I'm finding I have to zoom in more. Usually I was good at 100%, but now I'm having to zoom into like 120, 130. And uh, my wife said, well, you need to go see an eye doctor. I said, no, I don't. You can zoom in to like 500%. Like I've, I've got a ways to go. And for those of you who are married, I don't know how it works in your marriage, but here's how it works in my house. Uh, so what happened is I came home a few days later and my wife said, Eric, I made an appointment for you to go see the eye doctor. It wasn't a discussion. She just made the appointment. And so I go and I see the eye doctor and he, you know, he runs the exams. And you know what he had the audacity to say to me? He said, here's the deal, Eric. You have a slight astigmatism and you're a bit farsighted and you could probably be okay without glasses, but because you spend a lot of time reading and a lot of time in front of a computer, uh, you probably want to just put some glasses on when you're reading. It's just going to lighten the load for your eyes a little bit. And he could tell I wasn't too happy to hear that. And so he tried to assure me and encourage me. He said, hey, this is common um, for people as they approach 40. And I think I was like 38 at the time. And I, I didn't feel any assurance or encouragement by that statement. Um, so I have, I have reading glasses that I put on often when I read. And here, here's the deal, Glenn, if you and I were to switch glasses, now I don't, I don't know anything about your prescription, but here's my guess, here's my hunch. Your vision would probably be a little impaired. It might be a little blurry. And if I were to look through your glasses, my vision might be impaired, it might be a little blurry. And I think the same is true when it comes to justice. That oftentimes, we're viewing justice through lenses that are blurry, lenses that are impaired. One of my concerns in the culture today is that for many, we approach justice through blue lenses, right? So when we think about justice issues that are going on in our culture, right away, we kind of think through our own blue lenses and how people who fit in that camp would view justice. Now, some of you silently are maybe saying amen, but I would also say I'm equally concerned that there's many in our culture and in our churches today who, when it comes to justice, they're approaching it through red lenses and what those in the red camp might have to think on a justice issue. And the problem with this is that when we look at justice issues through these types of lenses, then our understanding of justice is partisan-driven justice, cable news-driven justice, family upbringing-driven justice, or social media-driven justice. And therefore, our approach to justice is impaired and distorted. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to do a bit of a vision assessment. I want to offer some corrective lenses because too often we approach our faith or we approach scripture through blue or red lenses as opposed to approaching everything else through the lens of scripture. And so I want us to look at what does the Bible have to say about justice? And when we look, through, when we look at the issue of justice through the lens of scripture, what we discover is the lens of love. So let me pray for us, and then we'll jump in. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to join together as your people, to lift up your name, to give you honor and glory and praise. We thank you for the words that we sang, that in Christ alone, our hope will stand. And I pray that that could be true for each and every one of us this morning. I pray, Jesus, that now as we turn to your scripture, that you would just quiet us, Pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive from you. Pray that those of in here this morning who maybe are carrying great pain would just experience encouragement and hope in you. For those of us who come in here and maybe need to be challenged a little bit, that we'd be open to that. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint me to bring good news to your church today. We love you, Jesus. Pray these things in your name. Amen. So we're going to look at Isaiah 
chapter 61, and primarily just one verse, uh, Isaiah 61, verse 8. But let me give you just a little bit of background. So the context here is the Israelites, the people of God, are living in exile in Babylon. Uh, They're oppressed. They have been enslaved. They're living in despair. And if we were to read the first seven verses, what we find is there's this progression, right? So the, the Lord is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to offer a word of hope. Right, so there's a progression from the people being in a state of oppression, captivity, and despair to a future state of flourishing, freedom, and joy. And then we get to verse 8, which is really the impetus for why the Lord is giving this vision to the people. Let's, and so this is verse 8, I think. There we go. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And I believe that in that one verse, there's two profound truths about God and justice. And the first is very simply that the Lord loves justice. God loves justice, which begs the question, what does justice mean in the Bible? Well, the word justice in the Old Testament, the Hebrew, is translated from the word mishpat, And interestingly enough, this word shows up over 400 times in the Old Testament. So if a word shows up over 400 times in the Old Testament, it's probably important. And the word mishpat had two dimensions to it. The first is retributive, right? So punishment for wrongdoing, consequences for a crime. Um, So if, you know, if someone says they get the justice that they deserve, like that's what they're thinking about, or this person will be brought to justice, that's retribution, Right? They're getting what they deserve for doing something wrong. But the second dimension of this word is more restorative. It's the idea of giving or restoring people's rights. And in the Old Testament, the majority of references to mishpat are specifically about restoring the rights of the vulnerable, marginalized, and disadvantaged. To treat people with equity. Another way to say this is to create a society where the most disadvantaged and vulnerable are cared for and supported. And so biblical justice was showing special concern and care for the cause of the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the immigrant, what many scholars have referred to as the quartet of the vulnerable. And we read here in Isaiah 61.8 that God loves justice. God doesn't just like justice. God doesn't just think justice is a good idea. He's not mildly interested in justice. Justice isn't just the fad of the day. It's not the politically correct thing for God to be interested in. God loves justice. God is passionately and deeply committed to it. And one of the reasons we know this is this isn't just an isolated verse. We see this idea repeated several times throughout the Old Testament. Here's a couple examples. Psalm 33, verse 5. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. A couple chapters later, Psalm 37, verse 28. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. In Amos 5, 24, I love the message paraphrase. God says through the prophet, do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. God loves justice. God desires it. He wants it. He wants oceans of it, rivers of it. But just as important as what God loves is what God hates. It's as important as followers of Jesus to think through what are, what are some of the things that God actually hates. And verse 8 goes on to say, I hate robbery and wrongdoing. God hates when people take what doesn't belong to them. God hates when people rob others of their dignity and their worth and their rights. God hates wrongdoing. He hates the systems and structures that oppress people and keep them at a disadvantage. I think another way to say this is that God hates injustice. God hates injustice. He's not mildly bothered by injustice. He doesn't just dislike injustice. He doesn't just passively wish that it would go away or that someone else would do something about it. God isn't just mildly annoyed by injustice. He hates it. So God loves justice. He hates injustice. And so not surprisingly, God calls his people to be agents of justice themselves. In Zechariah, 
uh, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we see this. Right? So this is the Lord speaking to the people through the prophet Zechariah. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty said. Administer true justice. Uh, other translations will say render true justice or dispense true justice. What does that look like? Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner, or the poor. There's that quartet of the vulnerable. Do not plot evil against each other. So God is calling his people to be dispensers of justice, to dispense this restorative justice to the marginalized and disadvantaged in society. But what we discover in the Bible over and over and over is that the people of God struggle to follow their calling. They struggle to, to follow this vocation of being dispensers of love-driven justice. They instead become the oppressors themselves. They instead hold people at a disadvantage. And so God ultimately sends his son, Jesus, as the ultimate dispenser of justice. And there's this great scene in Luke chapter 4, uh, where Jesus is back in his hometown of Nazareth. And he's in the synagogue, and he's handed the scroll. And the scroll's open actually to the chapter that we're looking at this morning, to Isaiah 61. And Jesus reads these words. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Right? So he reads this, and then he rolls up the scroll, gives it back to the attendant, and he sits down. Uh, in those days, the, the rabbi would stand up to read from the, the Hebrew scriptures, and then when they would give their teaching, they'd actually sit down. So Jesus sits down, and you would appreciate this. Here's how short his sermon is. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, if there was a microphone then, that'd be a mic drop moment for Jesus. So basically, he's saying, look, the prophets hundreds of years ago spoke of a day where true justice would be poured out along the land. And today's that day. Today, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. It's being fulfilled in me. Jesus is the true dispenser of justice. Jesus came to bring justice to the vulnerable and marginalized. He came to rescue and restore the image of God in all the oppressed and all the vulnerable. But Jesus came not just to rescue us from our physical oppression and vulnerability, but to rescue us from our deepest oppression, which was our bondage to sin and death which led to our separation from God. Jesus acted justly and righteously all his life, and yet he died for the guilty. Jesus disadvantaged himself so that we could experience the advantage of a relationship with a loving God. And friends, that's the good news. That's the gospel right there. That Jesus, who had all the advantage of the world, all the advantage of heaven, he willfully gave it up so that we could experience the advantage of a loving relationship with God. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus defeated the greatest forces of wickedness and oppression, and he offers us a life of unending, free, unending freedom and everlasting joy. That's good news. And if we believe this, that God loves justice and hates injustice, and that God expressed this in the ultimate way in and through Jesus, who came to rescue and restore us from all wickedness and oppression, then our response should be to joyfully receive that and to experience the freedom that he's given us, but then also to offer our lives back to him as agents of love-driven justice in our communities and in our world. In other words, if God loves justice and hates injustice, and if you and I truly believe in and follow God, then we should love justice and hate injustice as well. The late Tim Keller, he put it this way. He said, if God's character includes a zeal for justice that leads him to have the tenderest love and closest involvement with the socially weak, then what should God's people be like? They must be people who are likewise passionately concerned for the weak and the vulnerable. So to love God is to love justice and is to hate injustice. And my concern is that too often we miss this and there's a disconnect between justice and discipleship. 
And I would say we can't truly follow Jesus without engaging in justice. To be a disciple is to be engaged in love-driven justice. Right? To be a disciple is to engage in love-driven justice. And again, there's often a divorce between discipleship and justice. People say, well, we just need to focus on discipleship. We just need to focus on the gospel, not justice. Uh, a couple years ago, we, we had put on this event and there were several breakout sessions at the event, um, workshops on different topics. And there was a, one workshop that was facilitated by this group um, out of the Flint area. And they, they, they go to different churches and ministries and they facilitate roundtable conversations around uh, the gospel, justice, and race. And so they, they came and they, they facilitated this conversation and I, I was overseeing all the workshops. So I'm just kind of floating around and I sat in there for a little bit and, uh, and I was just deeply encouraged. Just some great conversations around the table, conversations that probably wouldn't naturally happen. I thought they just, they did a masterful job facilitating it and leading it and walked away thinking that's a really, really positive experience. And a couple days after, a, a pastor sent an email uh, to me and he said, hey, th thanks, for, you know, thanks for the workshops and the events. Um, I did want to let you know, we had several of our people go to the roundtable discussions and uh, they, they came away concerned. Um, they came away concerned about just the focus uh, that, that the conference has on justice and kind of the direction that things are going. But they did want me to let you know that they appreciate the conference's focus on discipleship. I remember thinking to myself in that moment, they're, they're missing it. It's not discipleship or justice. Justice is a deep part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Right? To be a disciple of Jesus is to be engaged in love-driven justice. We need to remarry the two. We need to remarry justice and discipleship. To be a disciple of Jesus is to engage in love-driven justice. So how can we do this? Let me suggest three ways, three what I would call acts of love. And the first is this, is that love cares. Love cares. What does it mean to care about something or someone? It means to feel concern, thought, regard. Um, we can't be apathetic to justice and be a follower of Jesus. So Dr. Martin Luther King, he wrote this letter uh, this letter famously known as Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And he didn't use the phrase love-driven justice, but you want to see one of the best articulations of what love-driven justice is, read that letter. And uh, the context of the letter, I never knew this till about five, six years ago. The context of the letter is there were some pastors in Birmingham that were, um, they were a little frustrated, a little agitated by King and his movement and just the disruption that they were bringing. They didn't even necessarily disagree with him. They just felt that the timing wasn't that great and the way that they were going about it maybe wasn't that great. And so from jail, he's, he's challenging them, frankly, to care. I mean, first and foremost, just to care. And there's many great lines, many great excerpts throughout this letter, but there's one in particular that every time I read it, I think is a good challenge for the church. So he says, so here we are moving toward the exit of the 20th century with a religious community largely adjusted to the status quo, standing as a taillight behind other community agencies rather than a headlight leading men to higher levels of justice. So in other words, he, what he's saying is, look, there's other people, other agencies that are taking the lead on loving justice, on engaging in justice work. And the church is just too apathetic. We're just too concerned with being the status quo and we're passively following behind. We just need to care. And frankly, I think his words are just as relevant a quarter of a way in to the 21st century as well. Love cares. If we truly love justice, then it means we care about all justice issues. It means that we have to care about all of the vulnerable. So we care passionately about the unborn and the sanctity of human life. But we also care about the circumstances that might cause a woman to even consider terminating a pregnancy. We care about things such as poverty. We care about abuse. 
We care about access to affordable health care. We care about government policies that affect the unborn. But we also care about policies related to voting rights. We care about immigrants and refugees. We care about systems and structures that hold people at a disadvantage because of gender and race. We care about those that are struggling with mental illness, underemployment, education disparities. Some of you, you hear all that and you think, Pastor, you're asking me to care about a lot of stuff. That's what it means to follow Jesus. C.S. Lewis once said, if you're going to be a Christian, you're embarking upon something that will take the whole of you, brains and all. Right? We're called to care about all justice issues. We're committed to justice for all the vulnerable. We don't get to pick and choose, which is why we can't fit nice and neatly in any camp. Jesus calls us to his kingdom, which transcends all earthly kingdoms, all earthly worldviews and ideologies. So love cares. Second, got to remember to advance here, love serves. Right? Love serves. As we notice, listen to, and care about the injustice around us, the needs will become evident. And we won't sit passively on the sidelines. We use our gifts, our resources, our influence to meet the needs that we've identified. We take a posture, not of what we can get from others, but what we can give them how we can serve them. We put the needs of others before our own. And while we care about all issues of justice, it's a little overwhelming to think that an individual or even a church could address all issues of justice. And so I think Jesus uniquely positions us individually and as churches to maybe really engage and press in and just a couple issues of justice. What, what might that look like even here in your own community? What would it look like to, to take on maybe one or, or a few different needs that, that we've recognized? I'll, I'll give you a, an example. I have a friend who leads a, a church in Kalamazoo. So uh, I live in Portage, Kalamazoo is the neighboring city. And uh, he started this church about four years ago in the Edison neighborhood. And the Edison neighborhood in Kalamazoo is uh, it's the most diverse neighborhood in the city. It's the largest in the city. It is... Uh, it has some of the highest poverty rates in the city and it also has some of the highest crime rates. And so as a church, they're thinking through what would it look like to just join Jesus in, in bringing about the, the goodness of our neighborhood. Um, and so they, one issue that they landed on was housing. And this is a neighborhood where there's a lot of slumlords. So a lot of people who, who buy these dilapidated homes, they don't do anything with them and they rent them out and they'll, they'll increase the rent. And so it's poor living conditions. Um, it's difficult for people to make rent. Therefore, they're not saving any money. And so what happens in the neighborhood is people just kind of go from housing situation to housing situation. And so as my friend and, and his church was kind of praying and thinking about this, they started kind of asking the question, what would it look like to create home ownership? Um, to break the cycle of poverty. What if we could help some of these people not just go from slumlord to slumlord, but actually be able to own their own home, which means they're going to care more about the neighborhood. They're going to invest in the neighborhood. And so uh, one nice thing is they could get a home for fairly cheap. And so as a church, they, they get a house and they raise some funds to, to rehab the house um, to make it something that's livable, something that a family would want to be in. And then they had a process where they would interview different people who are looking for a housing situation. And so long story short, they identified a single mom with a few kids and they offered her this, this home to rent. But here's what they're doing. They're basically socking her rent. They're saving it. And after a few years, they're going to turn around. They're going to give it back to her and she'll have a down payment either for that home or for another one. And they just got their second home and they want to do this again. Um, until they create home ownership for scores of people throughout this neighborhood to break the cycle of poverty. Uh, I also shared it's a, a high crime neighborhood and there's a particular, there's an abandoned park in the middle of the neighborhood that had uh, kind of been home base for gang activity. And so some of the city officials came to them and said, hey, if we gave you this park, could you do something with it? And so they take the park and they find volunteers, they bring people in, they get donations, and they fix up this park, and they make this beautiful little space where children can have fun in their neighborhood. And they had done some studies that showed that beautification actually reduces gun violence because even the gang members recognize that this is a place for children in the neighborhood. Maybe those aren't the issues here. 
Maybe that's, that's not the need that Jesus has identified for you in your neighborhood or here in Ferndale or Hazel Park. But who are, who are the vulnerable? Who are the disadvantaged among you? I, I love how when I'm here and if I look on your website, I, I see ministries like hitting the streets and how as a church you're seeking to care for the homeless or how you're uh, partnering with CareNet and um, helping those who are in, in crisis pregnancies. What does it look like individually and as a church to serve? Love serves. And then finally, love sacrifices. If we love justice, we will make sacrifices for the vulnerable among us. Love-driven justice will cost you. It will cost us money, time, relationships, emotion. We'll pay a price and it's probably going to hurt at some point along the way. But what did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, greater love hath no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus didn't just say that. He modeled it. He literally laid his life down. And in the same way, we're called to lay down our lives for one another and for the least of these among us. Like Jesus, we disadvantage ourselves to advantage the disadvantage. This is the heart of love-driven justice. One of my favorite examples of this in our Free Methodist story, happened in St. Louis, Missouri in 1859, which was one year before the official founding of the Free Methodist denomination. There was a guy by the name of John Wesley Redfield, and uh, Redfield was known as um, one of B.T. Roberts' main ministry partners. And most of Redfield's ministry at the time was in the the Midwest area. And so he's, as the story goes, he's preaching this revival uh, at this Methodist Episcopal church in St. Louis. And in his messages, he's preaching against the evils of slavery. Now, that time, our nation was literally split over this issue of slavery. And St. Louis, Missouri tended to identify a little bit more with with the South um, and was a little bit more embracing of slavery. And so he's preaching against this. And the pastor of the church and about half the congregation get up and leave. They're done. And so here's John Wesley Redfield. He's left with this remnant of a congregation that doesn't have a pastor. And so he writes back to B.T. Roberts. Basically says, hey, I, I need your help. I need you to help me figure this out. So Roberts comes and he reorganizes this congregation. Um, he comes and kind of reforms it, provides some leadership for it, gets it back on track. Um, but he does something that, again, would have been pretty radical in its day. He actually makes non-slaveholding a requirement for membership. In other words, he says, look, in this church, if you own a slave, you're not a member because that's antithetical to the gospel. And so it's actually, even though it's a year before our denomination started, many refer to this as the first free Methodist church. Now, what was Roberts doing there? It was an expression of love-driven justice. Motivated by love, he dismantled systems and structures that were holding people at a disadvantage, and he was calling the church to the same. For Roberts, he demonstrated love by caring, serving, and there was some sacrifice to that as well. I think, friends, in the same way, if we are to follow the way of Jesus, who loves justice and hates injustice, then we ought to be dispensers of love-driven justice ourselves. I celebrate the origin story of our movement, but I get a little tired of hearing about how we started. We need some new stories. We need some fresh stories. And Jesus is inviting us to be a part of that, and he's inviting you to be a part of that, to be a dispenser of justice where you live, work, and play. And so may that be true. May that be true of us individually. May that be true of us as a church that the marginalized and the oppressed around us would know that if they, if they interact with Ferndale Free Methodist Church, the people who make up this congregation, that they'll experience oceans of justice, rivers of justice, the love of Jesus just flowing from us. When it comes to justice, may we look at it through the right lens, the lens of love. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you that you didn't just call us to justice, but you model love-driven justice. That you did it for us in the, the ultimate way, that when we were oppressed by sin and death, you came in and you disadvantaged yourself so that we could experience the advantage of a loving relationship with God. 
But Jesus, help us to not just be recipients of that. Help us to join you in love-driven justice wherever we find ourselves, wherever we live, work, and play. Forgive us for the ways that we've looked at justice through lenses that distort or impair what it is that you've called us to do. And I pray that you would just give us increasing clarity on what it means to join you in being agents, dispensers of justice wherever we find ourselves. Lord, forgive us of our apathy. Forgive us when we haven't cared. Forgive us for sitting on the sidelines. Forgive us for just being all too content to have other people take on justice. Lord, may we recognize that to follow you is to engage in love-driven justice. I thank you for the ways that that's happening in this church. And Jesus, we just pray for more and more of it. Pray that Ferndale, Hazel Park, the surrounding communities, Metro Detroit, would be known for oceans of justice, rivers of justice flowing from your church. We love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.